Yeah, for real? For real, for real? My video is starting. My video is starting. Test, 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 test. Can you hear me in the internet world? Do, 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 do. Okay, I'm going to really quickly check the audio and closed captioning to make sure we're working. I got a new computer a bit ago. Um, and this is the first time I've tried to do a live since the new computer. If some of you have been around for a while, the captions are there. The captions are there! If some of you have been around for a while, you likely already know, um, or might remember if you've ever been to a previous live, I used to do these lives fairly, le, le, I see my hair, fairly regularly. I used to do these lives, but I had a computer that was doing the best it's, it could. We'll give it some love. My poor computer um, was an office computer from 2019, and it really was overheating and struggling and could not. Joan, I think you might be the first one. Well, there's, set, there's six people. I can't see who they are until you say hello, but there's six of you out there. Um, and so my old computer would make doing these lives pretty impossible because Facebook needs a lot of, um, hey Devin, Facebook needs a lot of, I don't know, computer power to broadcast one of these lives with the live closed captioning. Uh, that it has when you join from a computer instead of your phone and the live closed captioning is very important to my audience. TJ, hi! Um, and so, yeah, I needed a computer that could handle that and I didn't have one for a long time and now I have one. Thank goodness. Um, yeah, so I'm back. Uh, it's been a while. Oh, I've missed you too. Uh, I'm hoping now that the um, the, tech, the the video quality is better uh, because Facebook has like scanners. It knows when there's like a low quality video you're uploading and a low quality thing. And so if you, it senses it's low quality to like down rank you. And so now I'm hoping with the quality being higher, these videos will be distributed and people will actually see them again. Uh, let's see, uh, Devin, have you been on a Carnival Cruise before? I've never been on any cruise before. Uh, I didn't go on my first airplane until I was in my late 20s, uh, and it was actually as part of my job I had to go on my first flight. Uh, and so I've never been on a cruise. I don't know that I want to go on a cruise. I'm kind of terrified of the entire, the entire idea of going on a cruise. Uh, sounds really scary to me. Uh, anyone listening, have you ever been on a cruise? Uh, or are you like me where that sounds really intimidating? Because <laughs> it sounds like being trapped in a small space in the middle of the ocean with a lot of people and I wow you noisy truck um and I feel like I would be really worried about it sinking and I wouldn't be able to sleep I don't know I can barely sleep when I go to a hotel like I in an RV I travel well uh but traveling without my special magic sensory safe space the rv i don't travel well i i run through the airports crying when i have connecting flights i'm trying to catch i get lost all the time i can barely find my hotel room in a hotel i am a disaster and that was like the really hard thing for me back when i was touring and traveling and speaking at conferences back before the pandemic uh is that while i could get organizations and conferences to cover fees to fly me out and to like put me up they weren't gonna cover my plus one my person that helps take care of me and make sure I don't get lost and just just is like you know your person like you know and so I would have to be alone traveling in all these strange places and it was really freaking hard for me so I'm kind of grateful a lot of things went to zoom um I think I do stuff locally in Texas maybe if there's like somewhere I don't have to drive more than a few hours to do and I don't have to stay anywhere overnight. Like I'm open to that in person, but I'm not mentally ready to hop on a plane anytime soon. And, I, and, that, and it's kind of sad because that's a lot of the business right now that keeps coming my way is people that want me to fly out somewhere and I'm just like, no, no, I'm not ready for that. Like I, I never stopped really social distancing. <laughs> for the most part. I've had a few gatherings where I've met up with people, but uh, I really thrived in that solitude. Um, there's that song, Benny, it's like, lonely bee, lonely, I'm a lonely 
super lonely lonely i've been lonely oh anyway anyway that's my song i'm a lonely bee <laughs> so uh that's been my jam since uh the pandemic uh or whenever it came out but um uh, la, 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 la. anyway that's gonna be stuck in my head now um so yeah it's it's been an interesting year uh, i don't know the last time i did a live i feel like it's been a really really long time david was probably on the live with me david's around i promise he's still he's around he's at work right now um we let's do the updates uh before i forget um we're back in texas all things considered it's a little concerning um our rv is not in good shape right now we need to get the differential worked on possibly replaced uh, so we are just kind of sheltering in place, uh, working our butts off as much as we can, saving up to get that fixed. Uh, so if you're sending stars, that's where the stars are going to RV repairs right now. Uh, that's where all our pennies are being saved for is to fix our RV uh, to hopefully get that done by January is our goal. Fingers crossed. Um, so that's like our big thing in our life. Um, I'm just kind of here heads down working that's why i've been a little quieter on social media uh but i'm going to be now that i finally have a bit of a routine and more stability in my life for the first time this year <laughs> and it's november uh my mental health was in the trash like was in the trash it was in the toilet for most of this year after my grandfather passed away and uh we stopped traveling i just kind of fell apart um and so i'm feeling a bit more like a person now and uh my hair's bothering me um so now i'm feeling more like a person i'm feeling ready to come back to social media ready to come back to doing potentially some more live videos uh when i have free time i've started doing some one-to-one -one sessions which there's a pinned uh post on my wall i send out a note to the um sub stack and the channel members what is it called the facebook channel the sub broadcast channel whatever that is uh, i sent a note about that to the broadcast channel uh, i'm going to be making more reels again and putting out a lot more content this winter uh, the other update is i finally decided on the title for my next book which i'm not going to share the title just yet that's my secret until i get it like typed up uh, in the publishing website so it can be grabbed uh, but the concept is I'm going to, because, you know, my first book, Workplace Neurodiversity Rising, was looking at neurodiversity within a workplace system. And so the next book I want to, don't say the title. Um, okay. Uh, the next book I am going to be looking at, like, what is neurodiversity just as a whole in two yeah, in the like grand scheme of society as a thing and just like talking about divining, defining, divining, defining neurodiversity, uh, talking about the different ways human brains are diverse and it's a spectrum like as a whole, like, you know, like there's not just the sensory and the attention things. There's just a lot more. There's emotional differences. There's differences we're born with. There's differences we can acquire in life. So there's like all these ways people can be divergent or diverse in the brain and the neuro nervous system uh, but we often too much just are only talking about autism and ADHD and so we're not talking about traumagenic conditions we're not talking about uh, just so many things we're not talking about mental health conditions which are part of our brain diversity we're not talking about just so many aspects and layers uh, or the multiple ways like you know how it's like for example a concept I laid out in workplace neurodiversity diversity rising is, you know, often the more layers, like, you know, I, I'm autistic. I'm also ADHD. Those are some layers. Uh, I've got some other neurotypes I don't talk about publicly, and I probably won't ever talk about on this public-facing channel because I've shared so much of myself. I'm not going to share everything. You know, I've just decided that it's my right to keep some things to myself, and you should do that too. Um, <laughs> uh, but I didn't know that when I first started this blog. I was like, I'm going to tell everybody everything. Um, where was I going? Oh, the layers. Okay. Um, so the layers, you know, I, talking more about the layers and how, you know, the more layers you have, the more you're going to diverge from that. <laughs> why did it do that? That average, uh, that society is designed to cater around. And my theory that I have been working on for years around like neurotypical, I'm starting to call them neuro average people 
is that there isn't really a neurotypical person. Neurotypical is just this average our society has been designed to cater to, and that average, the neuro average, the neurotypical average, the neuronormative average, is just a social construct that is dependent on time and space and where you are in the world. So, for example, the social constructs would have been much different in you know, even in, in the US where I am now, 500 years ago. Or like even right now, if you go to Asia, things are very different. Um, social norms are very different depending on the cultures you are in. Some places eye contact, uh, which a lot of us autistic people struggle with, is not thought of as socially acceptable. So like that's now no longer a problem for people because looking at people in the eyes in some cultures is disrespectful and so if you don't do that it's like yay you're great but you know in western cultures uh, you're thought of as being shady and you're lying if you're not making eye contact so like all of these things that are average and normal have this dependent on time and space and the group you're in another example of that uh back when i used to travel and do conferences again um i had the extreme pleasure of being able to be in groups where it was other autistic people or and it's also later on other neurodivergent people but i was in autistic spaces first before i knew about my other neurotypes um and so it was so interesting to me because i always feel really awkward if i'm one-to-one -one with another person who's neuro average uh, and doesn't have some of those layers that in common with me like it makes me feel really awkward and uncomfortable and i feel really anxious and like i'm gonna misstep uh, but you put me either one-to-one -one with another autistic or neurodivergent person that has a similar flavor of neurodivergent to me uh, or a group of other neurodivergent people who are similar flavors of neurodivergent to me, uh, autistic, for example, ADHDers, throw me in a group of those uh, and I feel so much more at ease. I don't feel awkward. Uh, I, I feel much less uh, socially inept all of a sudden and it's just like this weight is instantly taken off me uh, without me even realizing it's happening I just feel so much lighter uh, and so something happened to me when I got to be at an autism conference for the first time years ago gosh I don't even know 28 no I don't know 2017 2018 I don't know I'm bad with timelines because um, my memory is Swiss cheese uh, but all those years ago for the first time I got to stand in a group with like five or six autistic people and we were just all talking and socializing and it just felt so good and then one non-autistic person walked up and tried to engage with us and they were so non-autistically awkward it was really beautiful to see the dynamic change to where when autistic people were in the majority this non-autistic person comes up and suddenly they're the awkward one and it okay you've got a noise good for you i don't know if y'all heard that revving engine outside good for you um and it just gave me a new way of thinking like how much of the way neurodivergent people are perceived as other has to do with us being in a minority uh and so that was just something that was really important to my life and i don't know why i got off on that tangent <laughs> Let me go back to the comments for a minute. Uh, I was just going to pop up on here a little bit and do a few updates. Uh, I just told a whole story. Sorry. <laughs> but if you do get me talking and you ask me questions, I, I did say I'll probably stick around for a bit if anyone has any questions or anything they need from me or anything I can help with while I'm here. Uh, like I said, David's at work. I just got done with my other tasks for the day and I don't want to go do my chores. So if you have stuff you can... Uh, you need from me right now. I don't have to go do my chores for a while. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go do chores. <laughs> Save me from my chores. <laughs> Give me a reason not to go do my chores right now. <laughs> Let me see. Why did the captions stop? Did they stop for real? Can someone give me a pulse on if you've got captions? Because I did have captions at the beginning. Let me see. I'm going to see if they're still here. Um, let's see. Samantha says, if I'm staying in a hotel, I have to take my own pillow and a throw blanket. You know, maybe if I took a weighted blanket, that would be helpful. Um, but yeah, I can totally see that. Like, I just, everything about it being unfamiliar and un, like, where are my safe foods? Like, where, how am I going to eat? How am I going to, like, all these things you take for granted are now suddenly complicated when you're in a new place. I, I hate it. It's my least favorite thing. Um, when the client was, like, sometimes they'll let you bill your meals back to them. Uh, and I got sent to Colorado once. 
uh, to Denver, which I love Denver and I love Colorado. It's one of my favorite, not Denver specifically, but Colorado is like my favorite place in the world. Um, distracted, stop, go back. Colorado. Oh yeah. And so the good thing about Colorado was that they had torchies, <laughs> which we have in Austin. And so that was one of the meals I expect, uh, no captions. That's annoying. That was one of the meals I expensed back to um, to my client was torchies because that's something that's from Austin. And so I was like, hey, it's a safe food, I know. I'm looking at this on my phone too. Because they were there when we started it and I don't know. Okay, here's a vote, everyone. Let me see if they're still here. They are gone. The vote is, do you want me to reboot and see if the captions reload or keep going? Uh, for those of you who are here right now, do you, most of you want captions? Because if you want captions, I will restart it for the captions. Uh, billing meals. Yeah, exactly. It's nice um, when you can bill meals back to your client. I love that. That was like one of the best things about uh, traveling to do things. I ate really well on those trips because you get a stipend for your meals. And uh, it's a lot more than I would normally spend on myself to eat. Uh, <laughs> especially recently uh so yeah that was really nice i'm from austin that's cool i'm in the houston area or you're from austin that's cool yeah i'm from actually from georgetown no need captions for myself if anyone says you need the captions i'll reboot it just let me know i'm watching to see that someone wants them and the minute i see someone watch that wants them i will start this over and we'll just do a new one um yeah i'm actually from georgetown but austin's the nearest big city people know of you actually know Georgetown? Do you know Georgetown? <laughs> it's uh, it's an interesting little place. Um, it's growing really fast. It was really like nature-y and small town when I was growing up. And all the rivers are polluted and low and gross. Yops, yops. So, shoot. What were the updates? Okay. So, I think that might have been most of the updates. Uh, so the updates are, I'm coming back to start doing live videos. I don't know how often yet. This is the first one. Surprise. Um, they probably will be a surprise. I'm really sorry for that. But for me with the, um, executive functioning and the pressure, like, oh, I've got to do it at this time. And then I've got to prep it and I've got to announce it. And the fact that Facebook doesn't, um, captions are helpful. I'm okay without them. Okay. Awesome. If I see anyone say you need them, like I said, I'll restart this and see if we can get them to go back on. Um, train of thought. God. Derailed. Mm, where was I? Loving the hair. Thank you. I started growing it when we were... It's really long. I have a lot of hair. Like, so much hair. I'm so glad I discovered this shavy on the sides haircut because my ponytail is, like, really thick. Look at this. Even just with it just being two-thirds of my head shaved. I have so much hair. I could never have long hair when it was, like, not shaved on the sides. I, well, I, could, I did, but it was just, like, not in Texas. <laughs> not in Texas. Torturously hot. Like, all the triple-digit summers with this much hair. And it's just, like, this big, poofy, thick triangle. My ponytail's, like, this big. It was too much. Too much deadly <laughs> thank you though my life is the pits family anyone got any plans for the weekend it's friday thank goodness it's friday i'm mentally spent i'm oh i was talking about yeah so i probably won't announce the lives in advance because of the the mental like it just like it's a lot more steps to create all the flyers and the announcements and all the things. And with the executive functioning for me, knowing I had all those steps to do before instead of just hitting live and going live like I did today made it like an obstacle, if that makes sense. So it would just seem like too many steps and my brain would go, oh, I can't do it. And I would get really stressed leading up to it. And so now I'm just like, I can just go live right now, just now, I'm just gonna do it. And so I'll, I'm probably gonna do it. I'm, I, okay, it's a secret. I wasn't gonna tell schedule. I'm gonna probably come live again next week. Uh, so be on the, be on the lookout for that. You know, it's just whenever I'm like, if I have a day where I've, I've got done with my work early and I just get a spare minute, I'm going to pop on here and go live and pop. Well, I don't, is that a correct thing to say? I don't know if that means something. I don't know. It means 
Uh, so that that's my plan for the lives in the future. That's the new live video format is if I'm feeling up to it, I get done with my work early or I've got a slow, quiet day, I'm going to be doing more lives. Uh, similarly, if you haven't seen it, because every time I advertise anything, Facebook doesn't tell people about it. I've started doing the $75 one hour one to ones. It's like a fundraiser. Uh, and I, what I've been doing is I release five of those one hour one on ones uh, at a time. And then I book up those five. I'll do those. It takes me a couple weeks uh, to get those done. And then if I have whole like space in my calendar again, like I'm going to, I'll put those out again and I'll just release them in chunks of five. Uh, and so there's information on that on Substack. Um, and like releasing them in chunks of five is like helping me with the executive functioning piece because all the scheduling and emails, I'm really afraid I don't want to like misplace someone, <laughs> you know, and not get back to someone because it's all the things I have to keep track of. So that's something else that's new. I've already started. I've done six of those already. I've got four left in my current block. Uh, and, and those have been really good. It's just a one-to-one -one casual one-hour Zoom meeting and we can talk about anything you want. We've, some of the past ones we've, without sharing private details, we've talked about our personal lives and stories. We've talked about music. We've talked about art. We've talked about writing. You know, we've talked about, gosh, just all kinds of things. Some of us, we just shoot the shit, goof off, hang out for an hour, real casual. Uh, and it's just been really nice. Like, it's it's the whatever you want time um, for an hour and it's just like a fundraiser I've been doing trying to help out because as some of you might know um, my day job is a DE&I consultant uh, and we are in a country that is rabidly anti-DE&I right now uh, and so half my business used to be queer inclusion training and about half of it was neuro inclusion training and last year I did three queer inclusion pieces of training and this year I did one, one. So it's really sad to see, um, but with the extra, you know, right now with the political climate, as long as I've got the extra time in my calendar, that those are the things I'm gonna be doing. More of these free live streams and on these lives, like today's just an update video, I'm giving updates, but like I said, if anyone has questions, I'll answer your questions, whatever's on your mind, what you wanna know best I can. Uh, in the lives, so if you ever want to bring questions for me or topics, even just throw out a topic suggestion, I'll go on it for a bit. Um, you can do that on the lives, and you know these are free community chats coming back. Um, I might do an evening one, but that's a little bit more tricky with our current living situation. Um, I am in my partner's partner's house <laughs> right now, uh, and the evening is the time when everyone is home and about out in the, like here and enjoying the house and watching TV, and it's kind of like our family time. Uh, so I don't know if we'll do lives in the evening just because I'm trying to be really good about family time because that's something I've been so bad about throughout the years over the past. And when my grandfather passed away in March, I just had this like wake up moment realization that I was really neglecting like family and friends and personal like life things and just my life as a whole uh and I was giving so much of myself to the internet and the work and also you know being in survival mode like trying to survive is like a big part of that um but it's just so much time that you know I can't get back and honestly I am more inspired and have more ideas and a lot of the ideas come when I'm not working, like in the quiet downtime. And I wasn't making this space for the quiet downtime. Um, and so I'm going to try and be better about that. Like, I'm actually really learning to unplug right now. <laughs> and, and, and I would almost even say, like, the social media was probably like an addiction level problem for me uh, for a lot of years. And I, I'm just trying, like, I had that wake up call. It sucks that it takes that kind of a wake up call, but um, yeah, so the family time, I'm trying really to make space for that. Let me drop in the comments. <laughs> Growing your mine out, but still keeping it shaved. Uh, look, I look forward to seeing how your hair comes out, TJ, if you post another picture. Kitty, uh, I do totally get the overwhelming of too many steps. Yeah, and I'm trying to have compassion for myself with that because it used to be like I was really hard on myself when I would have that problem like oh like and it happens a lot with food <laughs> like eating like just feeding myself right like I'm like oh I need to eat I need to feed myself and I don't realize I am hungry a lot of times until I'm like dizzy passing out from hunger already 
interoception is that the in the sense I, I get that one mixed up with the other one uh, so my sense of like am I hungry do I need to go to the bathroom things like that are a bit distance from my sensing ability and so I'm often very out of touch with the senses in the body like that and so I can be a bit detached from what my body needs until all of a sudden I'm about to pass out and then I can't ignore that because I'm gonna pass out uh, and then when I'm what I call that 911 hungry <laughs> when I'm 911 hungry uh, especially but even sometimes when I'm just tired or just not doing my best or the inertia is not there it there's a kitty knocking at the door um, I all the steps just like weigh on me and I just can't do it and so it's like if there's not something I can just grab and shove in my mouth like with like maybe one step at the most maybe two like but just just to just eat I'm not gonna eat I'm just gonna starve or eat garbage uh, like I've been eating a lot of Gushers fruit snacks this week <laughs> because I've been working a lot uh, and after this I'm done for the week uh, I took a shorter day today and I took a bunch of long days earlier in the week so I can take a shorter day today and this is me coming to hang out with you guys uh, after work so that's the, you, you humans not guys sorry you humans you beautiful creatures even some of you don't want to be humans I get that so uh, you, you beautiful creatures how's that is creatures okay I'm a creature personally um let's see my life is the pitts family uh gesturing broadly at the whole of everything too many steps yeah and that really depends on my emotional and mental load and capacity day to day when i'm burnt out like really everything is too much or if i'm stressed and i'm dealing with something like i haven't had a lot of stability in my life for the past like year really um since we've been back and a lot of things have just really changed like my grandpa died our oldest dog died uh we moved uh a couple times um but not like the move like when we were traveling where we were moving to nice beautiful scenic locations uh, i was stuck somewhere that was really not great for my mental health for an extended amount of months uh and then st stuck indoors uh because i couldn't go outside because the heat was so bad for the like most of the summer and so like i got summer seasonal depression that's new uh and so i was just like really not okay um for a lot of this year it was really not good uh so like i'm just now starting to feel like me i guess if that makes sense i don't know where i was going with that my brain my brain's kind of whooshy right now uh amani <laughs> hey oh i missed you too uh is lovely okay term of endearment yes yes love thank you uh like if i were to say hi lovely yes Yes, thank you so much. You're so sweet. Um, I appreciate you asking too. Oh, it's so good to see you. I like your picture of the Aurora. I'm very envious that I didn't get to see the Aurora anywhere. Like we're, we're way too south in Texas and we don't have dark skies around here. Uh, I spend a lot of time complaining about the sky visibility actually because I can't see the stars. Uh, I got real spoiled in dark sky country y'all. Real spoiled, sorry. Real spoiled. I'm missing it. Oh, Katie. Good afternoon, Katie. Oh, hey, Steven. The jacket and the red shirt are such a cute combo. Thanks. They're a couple of my favorite colors, I think. Um, and when you played with your hair and turned it into a ponytail, you look like a shield maiden. And that looks, that suits you so well. I don't know what that is, the shield maiden, but it sounds kind of awesome and badass. So thanks. <laughs> uh, I miss the evening time life. I saw that one already uh laughs in late diagnosed autistic female who lost her job after unmasking ow yeah so i had one job and two years a couple years in they moved to a new physical space and changed like where i was sitting and threw some extra responsibilities on my plate that were not very good for me uh and didn't mesh or jive well with the other kinds of tasks i was doing um, so it was like they were giving me receptionist work to do uh, and that's not at all like you know and answering phones and things and it was like but at the same time they were giving me a lot of things I needed to be left alone to focus on and I couldn't focus because I was constantly having to deal with every single question anyone had and answering the phone and that was not my job description and I was sitting under fluorescent lights and I had no natural light and there was like a busy open office 
and I was having seizures and I was wasting away because I was in a constant state of hypervigilance at all times. So it was like I was having heart palpitations. My armpits were constantly dripping and soaking in sweat and so were my hands. Uh, I was like, my heart was just like racing. Like little things would just send me into a panic attack just like that. And I just always felt like I was just like in danger at all times. And it was like, this is normal. This is fine, right? And then because my adrenaline was just constantly pumping, I'm like 130 right now, okay? I got down to 95 pounds, which is not a healthy weight for me. Uh, and I was just wasting away so sick. And when I finally, like after going to the doctor for like a year doing all these tests, my employer knew I was not okay because I was calling out and missing a bunch of work and I was having migraines every time I went to the office and seizures and all these things. And I was like, I found out I was autistic. I found out the sensory environment, especially the fluorescent lighting was a major trigger and I needed to like decrease my sensory load. And when I made the request, the, my employer was like, well, those, those quiet spots where people work in the natural light are reserved for management and leadership. And since you're not a management or leadership person, you haven't earned those privileges. And so I was told that my needs were privileges and that they couldn't accommodate me because every, because everyone would like what I was asking for and like internally screaming because I didn't have the cojones to say this out loud at the time. I'm just like, if everyone wants what I'm asking for, your system must suck. But I didn't say it. Instead, I went home and wrote a book about it. <laughs> and this employer came to me and was like, I'm the one in the book, huh? Like, sorry. I, try, I, I tried to make it so you weren't identifiable. I, I did my best. I went and uh, did what I could. But, uh, yeah, it's painfully honest. Um, and I don't say who they are because I don't want to shame them. But I don't think they're going to ever improve, unfortunately. Because a lot of what I needed them to do for me wouldn't have cost them a penny. But uh, after the, that employer did read my book and let me know they read my book, they were like, well, I just, or they, they claim they read my book. How's that? They claim they read my book. And they're like, you know, there's all these things I want to do, but we just don't have the budget. And I'm just thinking, most of the things in the book aren't going to cost you money other than just devoting time to them. So most of it's just being flexible and letting people modify their work environments around them. So if you're telling me you don't have the money to do that, I don't know if you read my book or it just went over your head. Um, so yeah, somebody didn't get it. Hey, Rodney. I can't hear myself think if I don't have quiet downtime. Yeah, no, like speaking of trains getting derailed, like my, speaking of which cat, stop it. Uh, my train of thought is like a train, like literally I get this train that's going and it gets the momentum and the speed and it gets going, but if something stops it, it comes crashing and all the little cars get knocked everywhere, right? And then I need a lot of time to like go back and pick up all the cars and put it back on the track and who knows if I'm going to even be able to find all the cars. I might not know which car goes in the front, what car I left off on. It's all a mess. It's like... I also tell people, like, my brain is like a bunch of marbles, and you drop the bag of marbles on the floor, and they're, woof. That's how my communication is, too. It's not linear. It's just like, this idea, and 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 they're all, like, branched trees. Uh, now I'm starting to sweat. I don't want to have sweaty armpits. Sorry. I'm gonna take up my clothes off. Sorry. <laughs> Inappropriate. Just the song popped in my head. I couldn't help it. Um, speaking of the train of thought. Yeah, so just like I get derailed and then I'm like, where was I? And it's like, it just takes me all this time to like go back in the focus tunnel. And it's like, if you just leave me alone, let me get my work done. I could do this five times faster than everyone else. But when you bother me and you're talking to me, it's taking me 10 times longer than everyone else. So leave me alone. <laughs> and it's like, people are so offended when you're like, I just want to be left alone. Whether it's like, you know, you're in public and you're obviously reading a book and you have headphones on or like you're doing something that's like, I'm busy, I obviously don't want to talk. And then someone's going to come up and insist to get into your space and like talk to you and make you like engage with them. And it's like, I'm sorry, they say autistic people are rude, but that shit is rude. So rude. So rude. And they say we can't pick up on social cues. Just saying. Not sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> Amani, uh, I found a great graphic someone made that's a 1 to 10 scale and each number has a different hunger symptom. Oh, yeah. 
been really helpful to me to figure out how where to post it so everyone here can find it too i don't know you might be able to drop it in the comments after the live ends then i think you can add photos but i think it's like a security thing you can't add photos when it's actually live just in case the moderation isn't happening and people might send corn c-o-r-n you know what i mean but with a p <laughs> uh, i think that's why I'm really glad to see you too, TG. I didn't know who would pop up, especially with it not being uh, announced, uh, the new format. Uh, thanks, my life, my Pitts family. My grandpa was really my person. Uh, thanks, TJ. Um, yeah. It's really hard. It's like a really, really big asshole. A really big hole and like a lot of regrets for just like the time I didn't give and it's just too late now. And uh, yeah, and it really sucks. And the whole thing was really hard and yeah, I can't. Mm. Okay, sorry, I just needed a minute. Uh, let me jump in the comments here real quick. Angie says, suggestions for second grade child who was told she had to hold te teacher's hand on field trips, eloper impulse control, but doesn't like to hold hands. I want to support her needs, but also understand teaching needs to keep kiddos safe. Wonder if that's not, uh, if that's not what this video is for. No, the video is for anything. I'm here for you guys, you humans, you people, you creatures. I'm here for you, all of you. Uh, and so yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, so if I guess my my question, if you hear me when I ask it, uh, is is the not wanting to hold hands a sensory thing, uh, or just not wanting to be singled out? and embarrassed because a lot of times neurodivergent kids like they don't want to be othered because we are already just kind of othered by the fact that a lot of us stand out even like if we aren't trying to like we try to blend in and we still stand out like that was me I was trying really hard to blend in but I stand my hair's doing fast I stop I can't um and so sometimes it's not wanting to stand out not wanting to be singled out uh and so that would be a very different than like if it's a sensory touch thing because if it's a sensory touch thing you could just I've seen like a creative idea could be like if you have like some kind of wand like a like something a kid wants to hang on to like a glittery wand or something kind of cool and fun you want to keep in your hand that the teacher could hold the other side of and y'all both hold it and walk together so there's no hand contact but you know the kids getting to hold on to something and not being touched if it's a sensory thing uh that's something that might be helpful uh, if it's not wanting to be singled out, um, you know, the teacher might have to be a bit more with cues and things or some other kind of reminder. Uh, and there are creative ways you can do little reminders. Um, but I'm making a bit of assumptions because I don't have all the information I need to answer the question. <laughs> but I hope it's helpful. Uh, Amani says, oh, food struggles. I have Arfred, an Arfred win today. Ooh, let's hear it. Um, I was struggling with eating this morning. I really didn't want to wash a bowl or even use it because it feels too big. Mood. Serious mood. Um, I found an espresso cup and nice made oatmeal in it because it's simply about the size of the vessel that was bothering. It's some simple. Oh, okay. Nice. Hey, like you got to figure it out, like what works for you and like hack your brain. Like, and that's the other thing is like the things that make something feel really big aren't the things that make things to feel really big to like just the next person like you know uh for me like uh, a big obstacle with washing dishes is like the water and especially in the rv like we don't have hot water ready all the time i have access to hot water but i have to turn on a little water heater why can't i think of that word a water heater i have to turn on a water heater and so the cold water it's cold by default unless I warm the water first. And so because there's an extra step where it's like, first I have to warm the water and wait five to ten minutes. I'm not going to do that. And I'm also not going to wash the dishes with cold water. Uh, and sometimes it's just easier to walk the dishes over here to my partner's house. <laughs> my partner's partner's house. Uh, where the water is warm on tap in the in the, in the physical house. Like the, the house house. Because uh, <laughs> that's easier. And it's funny how, like it's definitely more steps to like pack up all the dishes and come over here and wash them. But that seems like less steps to me because the water's not, not cold and I like hot water on my hands and hot water feels really good as long as it's not slimy, gross dish. Yuck. But um, that's the other thing because I knew like the slimy dish yuck, like the gross, I can't, I, and, I, and I don't want to describe it because then you're going to imagine it too. But that yucky stuff, 
but I don't want to touch it. Uh, if I rinse the dishes off and I make sure to wipe them down, like even if they're not washed yet, and I just put them and wash them later so there's no get gross gooey things for me to touch on accident, like then also it makes doing the dishes much less of a like, <clears throat> like something I'm going to avoid. Oh my god, this is me. I don't know what it was in context to anymore because that was four minutes ago. <laughs> I don't know what happened four minutes ago. Hi. Uh, what was happening four minutes ago? <laughs> Something, apparently. Uh, yay, it's live. Aubrey, yes, it is live. Modes place the page. All the familiar people rounding up saying hello. Am I just setting up Blue Sky? Are you there? I am on Blue Sky. I don't really know how to use it yet. Uh, I'm learning. I'm going to try and start posting over there. It feels kind of awkward and weird because I got really used to threads. I really like threads but because it's a longer character limit and I'm not used to the 300 character limit anymore. Like, so I'm going to get used to that again. Um, and that's a struggle because I'm wordy, <laughs> as you probably know. <laughs> uh, so I have to do like a bunch of little, little, little tweets. Not tweets. What are they called on Blue Sky? I don't even know. Skies posts. I don't know. But uh, I'm going to try to get on there more. Uh, I don't like that. That's why I wear headphones so people will leave me alone. Exactly. So rude. Uh, sitting with you. I'm so confused. Found you. <laughs> I was like that when my stepdad passed. I miss him so much. I'm so sorry for your loss. Like, I don't, like, I don't cry as much about it, but if the right trigger hits me, I will just break down and start bawling like you know, like ugly crying, they say ugly crying, like the snot coming out, like ugly crying. Yeah, it'll still hit me. A big, a big, uh, big round of the ugly cries will still hit me. And I, I don't know if that's ever going to stop because there's just so much there and just, I can't, it's not, I, I can't, uh, okay. Reprogram. Train derailment was four minutes ago. Oh, okay. I was like, almost derailed the train again. It's pretty easy to derail the train. And it's like, I tell people, like, when my brain train gets derailed, it's like, my mind's an Etch-a-Sketch, and someone is just, like, shaking the Etch-a-Sketch. Ugh! I use the Etch-a-Sketch one a lot more than the train, actually. And so someone shook the Etch-a-Sketch. And if you've ever driven... Driven? Drive... Have you ever driven on an Etch-a-Sketch? <laughs> if you've ever drawn on an Etch-a-Sketch... It takes a really long time to, like, draw up your picture on an Etch-a-Sketch. Uh, and then if it's erased, you're going to start all over. So it's like, if my Etch-a-Sketch gets erased, I kind of have to, like, go back and, like, figure it all out again. It, it's like a big disruption. Or if my brain was a light bright and somebody came up and, <laughs> and knocked all the little freaking light bright pegs everywhere. Is, is light bright still a thing? <laughs> Showing my age a little bit, if not... I hope it's still a thing. It was a fun thing when I was a kid. Uh, but if you knock the light bright box everywhere, all those little stinking pegs go everywhere. Yeah, that's my brain. Now I gotta scoop all the dang pegs up and put them back in the box and start over because you've just erased my concept. And then I'm like, whew, I'm here. What is happening? I can't remember. Hi, I was doing something and now I have no idea what it was. And this happens to me so many times a day. And I'm really good at acting like Oh, I got this. Like, I'm really good at acting like I'm not confused, even if I'm really freaking confused. I am an expert at acting like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so sad. Uh, the story of my life, I'm really confused a lot of the time. <laughs> That's fun. Just signs up in threads and I'm not sure I like it. Yeah, I, I like it better than Twitter because there's less Yahtzees. And because it has a bigger character limit, although Twitter might have a bigger character limit now, I don't know. I, I left because Musk is a deplorable goblin. I still have my page up there as a space holder, um, just so some Yahtzee doesn't take it and try to like pretend to be me because people know that username was me and I don't want it to get reused, but I'm really just hanging on to that Twitter just so nobody else takes it. Maybe I'm hoping someday it'll get sold to someone who doesn't suck so bad, but... I'm not going to be too helpful, unfortunately, because it is what it is. Uh, but Twitter was my original home on the internet before Facebook. Like, Twitter was my favorite place before it got ruined. Um, and then I haven't found anything I've loved as much as I used to love Twitter. Um, Facebook's been really good, though, because it's challenged me to do more of the speaking about the things. Uh, you know, which is, which is a challenge with the Swiss cheese memory. Um, 
but it also lets me write and writing I can I'm wordy like I said so it's nice that I can put long format writing posts on Facebook and I really like that and I like the community of Facebook and uh, yeah but it's really challenged me it's made me a better speaker um, yeah because I've had to like read the things I write because this format wants graphic and video graphic and video <laughs> I'm not not answer that off color text message right now. Like, what the heck, dude? Uh, that's inappropriate. <laughs> Never mind. It's the whole thing. Eh, distracted. Um, I relate to being wordy. Yeah, there was like something. Uh, Blue Sky is the larger character limit than Twitter. Okay, I think it's like 300. But I think Threads is longer still. I could be wrong. Even Threads isn't long enough for me. <laughs> I like Substack. You can do as long of a note as you want on Substack, I think. I don't think it has a limit. Substack Notes is the free section of Substack. Uh, and it's like a knockoff of Twitter and uh, Threads and Blue Sky with no character limits. So if you want something like that, Substack has, like, if you don't subscribe to anybody, you can still go to Substack Notes and, like, follow people for free. And it's kind of like a Twitter. Uh, and I'm on Substack Notes quite a bit. It's just a, a fun tip of somewhere to find me where you might not know. Uh, but it's got no character limits um, that I'm aware of. There might be one, but it's really long if they do. Uh, let's us wordy people have enough space to put all those words. It was like that meme that says, like, uh, the ADHD uh, style of writing is like, I write something and then parentheses and dot 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 brackets more parentheses. <laughs> everything gets brackets and parentheses because everything is like little extra bits of information included. Um, I talk in bubbles and parentheses too. I don't just write that way. It's like everything gets bonus, bonus information. Were there any other questions or anything else? Uh, because I think I did all the announcements um, that I needed to get through. I hope, you know, who knows? I, we, I might have got completely distracted off track and forgotten an announcement or two, but I guess, it, you know, when I come back, probably next week and randomly come online and do another live in the middle of the day uh maybe i'll remember or go back and watch this and see if i forgot something i can't watch myself <laughs> i don't like to go back and watch myself actually like uh that's the thing i really hate watching my own videos <laughs> i hate hearing my own voice uh and seeing myself on the camera it just feels really awkward it's like who is that why same Blue sky, blue sky. Is anyone else here on blue sky? Are you on threads? Are there any other platforms that you like that I, that maybe we haven't heard about that you're on that you've heard, like, that are new? Like if I'm missing it, information? Love to know. Curious, curious. I always forget that I have Substack. Yeah, Substack is, Substack is becoming my new favorite because of how much safer it feels than some of the other platforms like Twitter has a really bad Yahtzee problem and Facebook does too uh, Facebook because almost all of the posts are always restricted to um, followers only or whatever um, established followers only uh, that helps but sometimes they will follow the page and wait 48 hours or 24 hours or whatever it is just so they can make some nasty comment and then be ejected out forever um, uh, it's like, okay, bye, I'm just gonna block you. Um, but, you know, Substack, I've heard there are Yahtzees on Substack, but I haven't seen them. Like, they aren't sent my way by the platform. Like, the platform isn't suggesting that people who will be outraged by my content engage with my content. Like, on Facebook, which seems to be driven by outrage, Twitter is that way too, it pushes queer and marginalized content to alt-right pages so and people who will be outraged by that content a lot or in Facebook they'll have literal like groups that hate queer people and hate marginalized people like literally I would call them hate groups like literal Facebook groups full of people who hate hate group hate in a group um, and so like multiple times especially being a trans person uh, I've had my page shared to these hate Facebook groups and then it's just like waves of like an ambush of spammers just coming to say the most nasty, vile, disgusting things or angry and laugh react to my posts. Um, 
and it sucked more when you couldn't restrict the followers on Facebook uh, because I would just have to sit all day and just block people uh, so they wouldn't harass my followers and then they would just just cause chaos and like tell people to off themselves and really horrible things um, and so like Facebook to me like I still feel like if I don't keep it locked down that's gonna keep happening again and the only reason it doesn't happen now is because I lock it down but I haven't had that experience on Substack um, which has been really nice it's, it's not like fueled by outrage like some of these other platforms are uh, let's see Spoutable? Is that what that says? Okay, I'll check that out. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Rachel says, Twitter, I never really liked it, so it was easy just to deactivate my account. Twitter was the first place I found, like, the actually autistic hashtag, and that's where I invented the asking autistics hashtag, and I, it was, my favorite thing about it is it was very conversational. Um, as a person, and this m might be an autism thing, I'm really driven by the question why, like, anytime anything happens or, like, something like that I don't understand comes into my awareness I just like start getting like why 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 is this happening why is this doing this why is this thing happening and I get really obsessed with the why and I like a lot of times can't let go of why's uh, and that can be either a blessing or a curse depending on what hyper focused thing I'm hyper focused on so like for example if I become obsessed with a problem that I cannot solve or I'm powerless to do anything about and I'm obsessed with it and I can't do anything about it, I'm going to really just make myself miserable stressing over the whys uh, because of the powerlessness of that and not being able to let it go. And so that can be really unpleasant to hyperfixate on something that is just making me anxious. Uh, but at the same time, while it is a, a, a weakness in that way, uh, and that's the only thing it's described as like the preservative interest and the preservative obsessions are described as only a deficit in the DSM. Um, but also it's at the same time my greatest strength. So if I have this why, so like neurodiversity is one of those things, like why don't like, and, and like a problem, it's like a problem like that I need to solve. Like I need to understand it fully. I need to fix it. I need to solve it. I can't let it go until it's fixed or solved so like I I've been obsessed about neurodiversity and trying to help people understand it because the fact that people don't understand this has been something I've been obsessed with since I found out I was autistic because I was like oh my god I didn't even understand my brain was this different I just thought I was a broken neuro average person and so like that that perspective shift and just seeing how much better everyone in the world would be if we understood that the person next to you probably has a very different experience of the world than you do and everyone around us probably has a very different experience of the world from each other like why people don't know this has like been the why I've been obsessed with for the last eight years um, and so that's become my greatest strength because I am obsessed with a problem that I am working on and contributing to help solve uh, and I don't think this problem of like neurodiversity not being understood by the wider world is going to be solved in my lifetime um, and it's going to take so many countless people to like help the world understand that we don't all have the same brains and nervous systems but the more of us that work on this problem the better and like being obsessed with something I actually can work on gives me purpose and meaning and because I can't let things go like it leads me to solving problems when I can't let go of a problem I'm obsessed with it and so I'm gonna obsess over it until I know everything about it and or I can solve the problem and so it makes me turn into experts on things when I obsess about them. And so that's a really good freaking awesome skill, depending on what I'm obsessed about. So there's that duality in being autistic and being neurodivergent that we often see medical models completely ignore, that it's not just a deficit. Uh, and since it's not a superpower or a strength either, it's it's a human um, difference. And there there's there's both good and bad things about you know, all the different aspects of my neurodivergent identity. Um, so yeah, my current fixation has been politics. Yeah, being obsessed with this Project 2025 thing uh, has been a bit hard on my mental health. Um, and then just since the election, I'm, I'm hoping I can kind of like, my goal is to like take some time after this, um, take some time tomorrow to myself in the morning because David's got to go to work, um, and then take some time over the weekend to kind of 
like try to like mindfully redirect my brain with some other things that I can do that like you know to upset I'm gonna try to force myself to obsess about something else <laughs> really I'm gonna try and trick my brain into obsessing over some other things I know I can obsess over uh, so that I can let it go a little bit next week because I, I'm realizing I you know I've talked about it a lot and I don't know that there's much else I can do at this point so I've got to let it go a little bit because it's taking over my life um, and so that's not great uh, my current fixation is my lovely girlfriend oh people can totally be a special interest and I just want to say if your person is your special interest if you ever lose them as your special interest that can be really tricky so hopefully you know if a person's like I've had people like they start as my special interest when I was younger before I knew what that was and then it's like then I do develop more of a relationship and a love with them because they started as my special interest. Um, but it can, I, I've noticed from other people that that level of, um, focus on someone can like, like me, I'm very intense. <laughs> I'm very intense. I'm a very all or nothing kind of person. And so when a person is like my special interest, sometimes it's a little bit too much for them. So it's like, I have to be around people that are okay with my intensity and, and really want that kind of affection um and that's hard sometimes like finding people that are into it but I think that can be a really good thing for relationship like if the relationship is our special interest we're gonna work really freaking hard on it right at least that's my theory sub spoutable has an app as well okay cool is spoutable like Substack or is it more like Facebook or Instagram or uh threads like what what's it like videos like what is it tiktoky Rachel, I get that. How's the job going? Oh gosh. Um, yeah. See, I'm pulling my hair back. Um, it's not. It's they kept delaying my start time over and over and over again, and I took it because I needed something really fast and that I could get into like right away. Um, and they were like, "Well, we'll start you later this week," and then it was like a month later, and they kept like. They had this whole new HR process they didn't know how to do and it like eventually they wanted me to start and it was like when I finally had some work to do for my consulting business and they were going to want me to like start and it was going to overlap with that and I had to be like no this isn't what we talked about and I had to let it go. No we're not talking to spam. It's a spam risk. I'm like no thanks. Um, and so it really sucked. Um, but so that's why I started doing the one-to-ones, the $75 one hour one-to-ones in Zoom that I started selling uh, because I was on hold for this job that they kept telling me I was going to start and kept telling me I was going to start uh, and it was really going to be underpaid anyway, but it was like, I can start right now, so I'll take it. Uh, and so I thought I had a job and then I wasn't looking and then like, yeah, it just like really jacked me up because I had a deadline I was working towards. <laughs> You know, um, and it sucks, but it's okay. Like, I, there's a reason it didn't work out. And, you know, it made me, like, really force me to think about things and get creative about it. I was kind of excited about it, but, you know, it is what it is. I should have, I should have, uh, I should have known it was a red flag when they were paying the same wage as 20 years ago. But I was going to take it anyway. Like I said, I just wanted, uh, something, uh, just in you know just in the short term to make sure we were surviving but uh yeah all the red tape and bureaucracy but it's okay I'm a very intense person too yeah I think you have to be to like me <laughs> I don't know like I don't know I feel like I'm too much for a lot of people and in the face-to-face -face world it's hard to find the people that it's not too much for if that makes sense like but online I've had a lot more luck because I've let my freak flag fly, so to speak, uh, and the delightful weirdos, and I say weirdos in like a very loving way, um, a reclaimed way, uh, have found me, my merry band of lovely weirdos, and I'm so grateful because when I was projecting this ideal version of myself out, I, I was so, I was alone in a room full of people. Like, nobody really knew me, uh, not the real me, nobody gave me space to be me, and then when I couldn't mask anymore, really, you gonna make all that noise? When I couldn't mask anymore, nobody had space for me, so, uh, they took it really personally, like, it was something against them, uh, and it really sucked. 
Wow, the one-on-one -on -one sound really beneficial for people. Uh, so far, people have really said they took a lot out of them. Um, they've been really casual. I've found them very healing because I like talking with other autistic and neurodivergent people and kind of, um, I've been kind of lonely lately <laughs> because like David's at work um, and I got really used to him being here all the time and now like he's working like five or six days a week and he's like gone really early in the morning until really late at night because we're carpooling because we don't have a car uh, or a working vehicle at all right now uh, and our V's broken down and so like life's been really kind of hard but also it's really starting to get better recently uh, so that's good like that's a bit of a relief you know just like things are improvement improvement things are improvement words words are hard uh improving that's why i like you so much oh tj thank you uh similar to twitter but with no algorithm okay okay interesting i might check that out i don't know who chris bowsy is or if i said that name right uh but if not don't tell chris i didn't mean to Bobby! Oh, I'm glad I didn't leave yet. I was kind of thinking about wrapping up. I was trying to decide if I'm going to wrap up or stay for 20 minutes. We were talking about how interoception and not knowing when I'm hungry. And I'm starting to realize I'm hungry, which means I'm probably, like, going to get dizzy soon and have to go eat. Because, like, once I start feeling that fact that I'm hungry, I'm already getting a little loopy. <laughs> uh, so I'm getting a little loopy. I haven't had food today. Oh, but you know what I can do? More coffee. That's just what I need. Let me have some coffee. I put quick tip for those Arfred people and people who struggle to get nutrition and food in your bodies. I put Ovaltine or instant breakfast or some kind of other nutrition powder, chocolate flavored, in my coffee so that I can have a little bit of nutrition in my coffee. So when they say, oh, hey, your coffee's not a meal, I'm like, yeah, but mine is because it has instant breakfast in it. <laughs> and then this is my cup because... I forgot to wash my coffee cup yesterday, and that's how I help my executive functioning. I only let myself have one cup at a time, and so I have to wash the cup, or I don't have a cup. And I broke the rule today because I didn't wash my cup yesterday, and it, like washing a cup before making my coffee is too many steps. Like it was an extra step. I just like mentally couldn't, like, I cannot handle the cold water and the cold house and washing this and the fact that it's going to be gross because I left it from yesterday. I was like, I can't do this right now. So, this, I technically have two cups, okay? <laughs> so I got out cup number two, which I haven't seen this cup in a while. And I actually really love this cup. I miss it. Uh, this cup is beat to heck, though. Mm. Aw, David. David's so sweet. He's working very hard. Dave is working very, very, very hard. Uh, I won't say what Dave's job is. We try to keep our employers confidential just because we got people on the internet. I won't say any names that like to cause trouble. And, uh... Yeah, we just won't give them any ammo so they can harass our employers or anything like that. It's also why I keep most of my clients confidential because I have bad faith people who want to like reach out to my clients and tell them that they shouldn't work with me. It's like, no thanks. Not time for that. I have people that were like trying to find out the information for the doctor who diagnosed me so they could like call them and like try to get my medical records so yeah the internet's weird by the way um people are rude and just think they're entitled to so much that they're not entitled to bobby i'm glad you popped in today that was a good surprise protect your peace yeah and that's the thing like when i started on the internet eight years ago i was so like naive to the internet I I shared way more than I should have shared I shared a lot of things I can't take back now um honestly going back I might have started the blog under a suit uh, under a pseudonym and not used my face with it looking back because I can never um like go back in the closet now so to speak if the political climate continues to get really hostile like I can't take any of it back. I am completely exposed. Uh, and so the recent elections made me really painfully aware of how much I have exposed online that just can't be taken back. Uh, so like that's kind of a, a consideration. Uh, the fact that I've had people like trying to like stalk and hunt me down so they can figure out how to harm me and those I care about. 
uh, people calling to have a hit put out on me. Like, like I didn't know. That's why when we were traveling, we would never post videos live because people wanted to find out where we were at one point. I had someone talking about trying to poison my dogs or to find me in the grocery store so they could punch me in the face. And they were trying to find out what grocery store I shopped at. Like, and I didn't understand when I started on the internet why people were so mean. Like, I didn't understand. I used to get really, really hurt and really sad by people who were just mean and said ugly things online. Like, I would take it really, really personally because I was really sensitive and I just... Yeah, poor, poor eight years ago me. Like, didn't know. And like, today it's like, I block people so fast. Like, all of those things I mentioned, like... I'm numb to all that. It's all like water off a duck's back. Now I'm like, somebody like tells me how I should off myself. I'm like, eh, block, bye. Someone tells me like, oh, that they want to come and hurt me. Eh, bye. Like it's, it doesn't even raise my pulse anymore. I'm just like, oh, bye. Um, but it used to like send me into serious like fight or flight, like hypervigilance. I was like, I would be like really scared. Like, are they going to find me? Are they going to hunt me down? Like, you know, like. It was scary back then. Like, I was, I was scared. Now I'm just like, you clown. Goodbye. Like, AOL. The guy, the guy, the AOL voice died. Did y'all know that? The, you've got mail. Goodbye. He died. Um, recently. Goodbye. Um, I goodbye people real quick now. In, in, in the internet world. I wish I was better at goodbying bad people on, in face to face. I'm a little worse at that. Too naive, too. Now I'm way more cautious. Yeah, it's been kind of a wake-up call. How are your dogs, uh, most place to page? Thanks, Rachel. You're a good human. You're so kind. I try to be. I try to be the best human I can possibly be. I try to be kind and understanding of people. Uh, the dogs are good. We have four now. We're, we lost Rocky um, a bit after I lost my grandpa. Um, but Bear is still a rambunctious monster. I love her. My wild child. Uh, I wouldn't have her any other way. We're living walkable to a town now, which is really nice because Bear was raised out off leash in the desert in the woods. Uh, so Bear doesn't know how to walk on a leash because <laughs> I just let Bear be a wild baby. So now Bear's learning how to be on a leash and around city things. And um, there's things to desensitize Bear to now. Uh, and so that's been really good um, because Bear needs that. And Bear's also a really high energy dog. And the last place we were in was like kind of an unsafe place to go walk dogs because like there were just like packs of wild dogs. So like one day I was walking by myself, luckily with no dogs. And like I got swarmed by 20 or 15 to 20 wiener dog size, small dogs that were trying to attack me. And so like, there were just like packs and packs of just loose dogs everywhere um, in this like area we were living. And it was just like, you couldn't even go for a walk uh, because you would be attacked by swarms of dogs. Um, <laughs> And, and like I'm good with dogs so like I could handle it sometimes but it was like I could never take my dogs with me because I couldn't expose them to that um, but I would go walk anyway but it's like I like walking with my dogs because I have a lot of anxiety and I feel really anxious when I'm alone by myself outside without my safe person or someone it is a safe person for me or like my safe dog my dog except for the tweenie the tweenie doesn't make me feel really safe <laughs> sorry he's not ferocious enough but I need, like, one of my three bigger dogs, or Rocky, when we had Rocky, like, I would feel a lot safer with one of them, and I couldn't walk with my dog, so I couldn't go out, and it was really not so bueno. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're doing good. Uh, I think they're really liking where we are now, and there's a dog park I walk to with them sometimes, and so, uh, it's been really nice being around walkable stuff. Um, walking is, like, how I get my, like, I regulate you know, like different sensory seeking things and stems, like ways we can get our sensory diet filled. Walking for me is a big way to like sensory seek and regulate. Uh, and it's, um, it's something that just helps me. And just since I've been able to go out and just walk around now, uh, that and just being outside and just walking, it's just my mental health. Like it's just had a really big impact on my mental health such a good impact like I, I felt really trapped just trapped and it was like out in the middle of nowhere like you're once you get out to this property with all these other like I don't want to describe it too much because I don't want to give it away um but it's a, it's a there's a lot of broken down stuff out there and it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere and there's nothing really near it and so you're like 
isolated out there uh with with like yeah yeah 30, 30 to 50 wild dogs yeah yeah with literally like just i don't know if it's 50 but there's probably at least 30 wild dogs in that residential area that are just loose and like if, if you've never been somewhere where there's a lot of wild dogs or something called pack mentality that dogs get and so even in a small pack you can see this happen but it's much worse when there's like dogs just loose um uh and so you get a bunch of dogs together and if there's an outsider or one of the dogs that's in the pack decides it doesn't like you or is going to be against you or like has a problem with you and it goes after you all the dogs will swarm you because they got each other's backs and so it's they they can become very aggressive and they can attack and kill people if you're not careful like so like the it's it can be really dangerous actually but most of the dogs that were loose were smaller dogs which is good um like medium below the knee and lower but there are some like there's probably about okay let me think i can see them in my head that guy that guy that one oh i like that one oh i like that one too there's probably about like maybe 10 large dogs in the that run in the pack in that area we were living and all the large dogs I'd already kind of made friends with on one-to-one -one because a lot of them don't always run in packs. And so you can approach the dogs when they're not in their packs and meet them and become friends with them. And then that might give you an in. Um, but if you meet them when they're in their pack, it can be really dangerous. Um, <laughs> random things I know about dogs. I used to be a dog trainer. Hello. Um, studying dog training and animal behaviorism is actually one of the things that kind of gave me the first aha moment that I might be autistic. Uh, because I learned about autism through a, an animal behavior book and then I was like I googled autism after that because the book I was like oh this is just like me am I autistic and then I googled it it was like medical autism speaks mommy blogs and I was like well that doesn't sound like me no I guess not because other people who aren't autistic describing what an autistic person is like I didn't see myself in that and so I was like okay and I put it away and then like six months later when I finally got referred for a mental health assessment for anxiety because my doctor was like, you're physically fine. I think it's in your head, basically. Um, when I was burnt out and sick, uh, I was like, can I see someone that knows something about this autism thing so I can rule that out? <laughs> we sure ruled out that autism, didn't we? <laughs> uh, didn't really end up ruling anything out. Um, but that was a good thing. But anyway, it's funny because the doctor's like, I don't think you're autistic, but sure. And gave me a referral, gave me the card for the referral. Uh, and boy, were they wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's the same with people. Yeah, sad but true. Mo, well, you're not wrong. Not wrong at all. Uh, and, and that's kind of what we're seeing, like, the, the Trumpers. They're like a pack of rabid dogs. Or a, a, a just a, not even rabid dogs, because the, the, the pack dogs aren't rabid. They're just pack mentality. They're just, like, anyone that's not in their pack is the enemy that's, like, how they are sometimes or is like something to hunt if they're big dogs but these little dogs they don't want to hunt me they just want to bite my ankles <laughs> which I, I'm not down with the ankle biters and they're yappers too they have the worst noises they're like yee, 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 and like it hurts your ears because it's like harsh painful noises it's been an hour and 13 minutes almost um and I was just gonna pop on here and say hello and give those updates but all the familiar people started coming on so it felt like I had to Cultish mentality too. Yeah. Wait, what were we talking about? ABA? <laughs> oh, Trumpers. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> well, it is Christian nationalism. And I would say Christian nationalism is a cult and they're trying to force everyone in the country into it. Uh, and I mean, look at it. Like, And then it went to ABA, which is tied to Christian nationalism, which I've written about in the past. Um, like, look at like Focus on the Family and James Dodson and George Wreckers. Like, look up those names. Look up George Wreckers and Ivar Lovas and look up the Feminine Boy Project and then look up ABA and you can see that uh, the Focus on the Family, uh, Christian Nationalist people, and the ABA people are the same people. Uh, and it shouldn't be surprising, right? They want people who don't conform to, like, conform into the system conform into the system they want to put you in the meat grinder and spoosh you out sorry that was a bit extreme <laughs> i didn't mean to yell aba and trumpers yeah they go hand in hand um aba and christian nationalism it goes hand in hand i've written about it a bit in the substack in the past uh if you go to substack and search for my aba master post uh that is a free post 
there's some links to some other posts that have some stuff locked because uh, the ABA stuff is controversial to talk about and I get so much crap for it that I put it on Substack and I don't really put it on Facebook much anymore uh, because I'm not going to argue uh, over my lived experience and what having behaviorism used to try and extinguish my neurodivergent traits on whether or not that was harmful to me or not. I'm not going to debate it, you know, um, with people who want to tell me, oh, well, you know, you maybe you weren't harmed. Maybe you're better off because of it. And it's like, no, I'm not. Um, and, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not, but I'm not going to argue with people anymore. So I just, I wrote it all up, put it on Substack and that's where it lives. Uh, so I don't have to keep revisiting it, uh, reinventing the wheel because, um, it's just really traumatic to have to think about behaviorism all the time and just think about how I was systemically trained to hide parts of myself uh, and systemically trained to ignore my own needs. And so I didn't know what my needs were because I was like brainwashed basically. And it's like, and I wasn't even diagnosed autistic. And people are like, you can't know about ABA because you weren't diagnosed. And see, I'm already talking about it and I'm getting really nervous right now. Like there's heat raising my body. So I'm going to get off the topic really soon. Um, but people will sometimes say, oh, well, you weren't diagnosed. How can you possibly know if behaviorism is harmful or not? But it is because I wasn't diagnosed because nobody knew I was neurodivergent, because it was assumed I was neuroaverage, it was assumed I should be able to behave in a neuroaverage way. It was assumed I should be able to behave in a socially acceptable way. And because nobody knew I was autistic, behaviorism was used on me to try and make me more normal, make me more appropriate, trying to squish and get rid of my neurodivergent traits, my ADHD and being autistic. Uh, and ABA isn't just used on autistic people either. Like, it's not just an autistic problem. Like, ADHDers are often being recommended for ABA uh, or just any kind of child that is labeled as having behavioral issues, behavior problems, just this cap of bad behavior, which is not a trauma-informed way to look at children who act out because they have unmet needs and other things going on. It is just, like, squishing the signals that they need help and they don't know how to communicate it or they can't communicate it or there's just some need not being met like it is just squishing that need to like reach out and ask for help and it's it's marketed like towards just any kid that has undesirable behaviors right uh and why are there balloons that is not appropriate <laughs> but so i was a kid that was thought to have had a lot of undesirable behaviors uh and so behaviorism was heavily used on me uh, in elementary school in city of Georgetown public schools when I was growing up uh, and especially in city of Georgetown I'm calling them out putting them on blast for the first time like by name uh, but also in Pflugerville too but it, it was really worse than city of Georgetown um, and it was because I wasn't diagnosed that the behaviorism was used on me so heavily because the expectation was that I should be able to perform normalcy so yeah I do know uh, the extreme cost that it had on me. I can't speak for anyone else, but I have tried to give this page as a platform for others who feel that having behaviorism used to extinguish their neurodivergent traits was harmful to them. So, yeah, that was a tangent I didn't go off on, and I really hope the ABAers don't find this video. I'm going to have to go lock it down to, like, subscribers only now, followers only, because uh, somebody's going to have something to say about that. So they always do. Behaviorism is a faulty scientific method. It's not scientific, though. <laughs> you know, like, they, they want to say it's scientific, but it's like, yeah, it's just, it's just so surface level. It's just ignoring the reasons behind everything. It just, it doesn't get to the why. And as an autistic person who is personally obsessed with whys, like the why, wanting to know why, that doesn't work for me, right? Um, and I used to use these methods with animals and dogs. I told you I'm a former dog trainer and I learned about dog training from outdated materials in the 90s when I was a kid because it was my obsession. So like, I, I've used the methods and I've given up using them with animals. Like I wouldn't even use these methods on animals and even modern dog training doesn't use aversives, punishments, and like 
R plus or positive only dog training, like that's kinder than ABA, which is often still using punishments, not always, but uh, so even animal training is gentler. Uh, but that's a conversation we're not ready to have, right? Like how animals are often treated better than neurodivergent children. You know, we're dehumanized that bad that we're treated worse than animals. Well, we are animals, but you know what I mean? Like, we're supposed to... We, we don't... I see animals as equals to people. Like, just put that out there because some people don't. Like, I don't see the dog as lesser. Like, the dog is my friend. It's not my property, you know? It's not a lesser being just because it doesn't speak or use words the same way. Like, my dogs understand me and mostly I teach them a lot of words so that I can talk to them and they can, like, signal to me what their needs are because we have a, a way of dialogue with different, like, verbal cues and hand signals and things like that. Like, we talk to each other uh, and I watch their body language a lot because they don't use words. Um, and so, like, if I see, like, animals as equal, I have a hard time believing that people don't see other people as equal. Like, that just is for me, just doesn't do it. I'm just like, how, why, what? It just, this is something that bothers me so much. Like, we're quicker to give AAC devices to animals than we are to people. You know, right? Like, it's, it's a whole thing. Um, but I think we should be kinder to animals and people, personally. Uh, yeah, more about control for perceived norms. Exactly. Yeah, special ed. I did, I was a kid that was in special education, remedial, I was in regular mainstream and I was in gifted and talented and none of those, and I went to private school. I went to private Christian school for a while. That was torture um, and very traumatic. Uh, ew. Yeah, no. Um, and so none of those options were good for me. Homeschool, self-paced homeschool probably would have been the best option for me, but it wasn't available at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. I tried to cover it so it wouldn't be like all up in the mic, but it was coming. Hi, Kaylee from Germany. Germany? What time is it in Germany? Keep hanging out. I might just stick around for a bit. Exactly. Many wouldn't use the compliance dog training, but it's okay to ABA kids. It makes no sense. Excuse me. The noise is coming. I don't have a mute button. I'm sorry. The fire trucks go by here a lot. Oh, it's just one. Okay. It's gone. I don't know if that was a fire truck or an ambulance, honestly, but... Uh, that happens. How, how loud was it for you? I watch people's body language. Okay, here's a fun story about body language for me. Uh, I learned as a kid because I was obsessed with... First, I, well, I got obsessed with, like, animal psychology, right? And animal behavior. And, like, I wanted to be Dr. Doolittle, right? Like, I felt more kinship with non-human animals than I did with people for most of my life until I found out it was neurodivergent and started to find other neurodivergent people and my life changed a lot in that respect um but oh yeah okay so I wanted to be like Dr. Doolittle basically um and it like I was obsessed with learning how to understand how to communicate with animals um, which led me into that behaviorism thing, uh, for a while, uh, but I, I stuck to the communication piece. Like, the communication is the first most important piece for a relationship with an animal because it's like, you have to be able to communicate with each other so that you can build a trusting, loving relationship where you can nurture them and teach them and show them things. And so that's how I have a relationship with an animal. Like, I love them and I teach them and we have a relationship with them. And I don't know where this came from. <laughs> where are we going? Why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about dogs and dog training? <laughs> I'm so confused. I was able to keep it going, but I don't know where that, how that started. Oh, we were talking about ABA. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, I gotcha. Uh, oh, body language. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, I, I know what we're going with this then. Um, <laughs> so, I didn't, I learned to watch animal body language because I was obsessed with animals growing up. And like, I studied it with books and videos and things and I studied what the different ear and face positions and muscles in the animal like especially a dog meant but I can read any animal's body language regardless of the species uh, even some bugs uh, but I didn't it, it just never occurred to me that people's body language and facial expressions like meant anything <laughs> 
it didn't occur to me until I found out it was autistic. And then I realized I didn't look for non-spoken. It just didn't occur to me to look for unspoken cues in people because people talk. Like, animals don't usually speak with words. So I was like, okay, they don't speak. So they talk with their body. So you have to pay attention to their body. If you want to talk to them, it makes sense. But people, because they speak with their mouths a lot of times, like before I understood what I understand now, I was like, well, people speak, so there's no reason to understand their body language. Like they tell, people can tell you how they're thinking. And like, I didn't learn until I was in my thirties and I started studying body, human body language and facial expressions, what they mean. Uh, but even then, like now that I'm aware of them as a thing, like, because I didn't used to be aware of people's face, it just it wasn't aware, it wasn't aware. It didn't occur to me to be aware. Um, like, I'll be more aware, and like, so David will make a face now, and I'll be like, what's that face mean? Like, you're making a face. I, I don't understand this face. Can you tell me about this face? Like, what are you thinking for that face? And I'll ask people, like, about their face that they're making now, because, like, I wouldn't have noticed once upon a time. Um, and so that's, like, something I'm, like, learning, like, a foreign language, uh, how to understand facial expressions and body language. It's kind of cool. Like, you can learn it. I do have, like, um... A diagnosable uh, level of face blindness um, which complicates things a bit I'm sure in some way I don't quite understand it super well um, but I know that means I recognize people by their voice more than their face a lot of times uh, so yeah like actors in movies I'll hear their voice and I know exactly like I can see like not necessarily see but like I know what the actor like see the other movies they were in like not necessarily see their face but I, like I know who they are by their voice like I see like oh this is from this movie and this movie and this movie and it's like that actor uh, and a lot of times I recognize their their voices before I recognize like their physical characteristics unless it's like something very um visually memorable like their hair or like a way they walk or a mannerism or like something about their stature um or like they have a really unique feature I can remember them and recognize their faces but uh yeah it's you know, like really cool things you learn about yourself when you learn a neurodivergent like the different ways you recognize people like some people can remember every face they've ever seen and like they can easily recognize people and like me uh if you change your hair even though we've met before uh, and I know your name and we've talked uh, before I hear your voice and you come up to me and you just wave or something, I'm probably not going to recognize you <laughs> because I need to hear your voice or like see this distinguishing feature or have context like, oh, we talked about this, then I know. Um, otherwise, I can't, I, I'm not using the face a lot of times to recognize people. How do we get here? Where do we go? My lonely. I am with, I'm like that with cats. They're my special interest. Body language stems from trauma. Uh, the, oh wait, oh wait, it's different, it moved. Oh, they are my special interests, especially when I was younger. Yeah, I wanted to be, when I was little, I was like, I'm going to be a cat when I grow up, because I couldn't imagine conceptualizing being, like, an adult human female. Isn't, isn't that what they said? What is a woman? An adult human female. I'm like, what? Anyway, I couldn't conceptualize being this woman I was supposed to be. And I was like, I'm going to be a cat! Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm going to be a cat! I can't, I just, I'm going to be a cat! <laughs> that would have been my answer. The reason I learned about body language stems from trauma. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know if it's, you know, I, I have to, I wonder like a lot about like in my own brain, like what's autism and what's trauma. Uh, and I've become much more hesitant since understanding, like when I was first diagnosed autistic and I didn't know I had a multitude of neurotypes, I attributed like all the ways I was different automatically to being autistic and then I started learning about the other neurotypes and brain types I have and the other things that are going on like the the ADHD and the, the OCD and the face blindness and like you know the other things and all the things and I started realizing like there's so many more layers to it and I think that's why when so many like people talk about autism or when people think about autism they often think autism includes all the additional co-occurring conditions that are common in autistic people because so many of us even when we describe our own experiences like I didn't know how to differentiate what's autism what's ADHD what's trauma right and I'm still trying to figure out what's what's autism and what's trauma that's like that's what I'm trying to figure out right now like what's what how much of this is trauma response how much of this is related to my autistic way of processing 
um, because like a lot of the medical definitions of autism describe an autistic person who's traumatized and in distress and I don't think we even know an autistic person who's not traumatized not in distress and not um, struggling looks like right we don't have a, a medical picture of autistic success because the medical books think success is becoming neuro average and that's not that's not it trust me I tried I broke my brain and then I couldn't do it anymore so at least for me that's not it like those of us who have so many layers to our neurodivergence it's just too hard for us to like perform normal all the time it's just too much of a high mental cost and like even when I thought I was doing a good job performing normal people still cloaked me and I still like it's that uncanny valley effect uh, that right like it's still something not quite human about this one even when they're wearing the human mask something is off like people still cloaked me as an alien you know I don't know it just I, I'm not saying autistic people are aliens I'm just saying like people still knew there was something there even when I thought I was like masking so well and then I realized I mask even when I don't realize I'm doing it like I don't know it's a lot uh yeah it's so much. And so, yeah, so it's like, oh, it's trauma. That's why. Okay, yeah. So it's like, that's, a, that's where I am right now. I'm trying to figure out, like, what's autism and what's trauma. And that's also why I'm hesitant to, like, do as much, like, declarative teaching, like, this is autism. This is this. Like, I'll talk more about neurodiversity generally as a whole and the human spectrum of brain differences. I'm comfortable talking about that. I'm comfortable sharing a lot of my personal experiences and stories. Um... But yeah, I'm much more hesitant to like define things and give a bunch of terms, especially terms that are like really medicalized. Like, I don't know, got a funny feeling about the way the medical industrial complex views neurodiversity. And I don't have words to put into this shift in my attitude yet, but I'm just telling a lot of lived experience stories and just I'm doing a lot more narratives and storytelling now instead of like lecturing and teaching except in my day job I'll still do lecturing and teaching but even then a lot of that um, what I've been doing with organizations recently because of the anti de and movement is um, where we come in and we do a, like a structured Q&A where we together create between 7 to 12 questions that we do in about an hour where they have like a fireside chat style interview with me and I like bullet point it so that the educational points are hit but it's not like a talking head PowerPoint presentation because organizations are scared of anything that feels declarative and that way it can feel more lived experience and more like a human story and I'm just answering your questions um, to get around all these anti-DE&I rules um, which is fine because it's more humanizing and conversational and also it lets me be more like this is my lived experience other neurodivergent people can have very different experiences and I can be really clear on the fact that I don't speak for every neurodivergent person in the world because in the past when I was definitely not trying to speak for other people and was sharing my experience and my opinions people would just be like so upset when they saw things differently uh, and it was like, no, this is just an idea I'm trying to throw out here. Like, I'm not telling you you have to agree. It's just my idea. I just want to put the idea out. Uh, and so this just lets it work in a nice format where I can be really clear about that. Chicka -chicka boom. Kaylee says, it's awful when people's body language and facial expressions don't match the words they speak. I hate it. And as a high sense, HSP, high sense leader person, I can also feel it. Yeah. And see, I didn't learn to pick up on that very well and so my experience is because I didn't have that understanding of like tone facial expression and body language like should mean something and it should really like be screaming at me if like the actions or the the body language doesn't match like I didn't know when people had bad intentions I didn't know when people wanted to coerce me and manipulate me and so I got into a lot of relationships in my life of various kinds that were not safe people not safe relationships that were exploitive exploitive relationships uh, so and that that wasn't just um, romance uh, I got into exploitive friendships not really friendships but I didn't know they weren't friendships um, I got into exploitive uh, romances on multiple occasions especially when I was really young uh, and then I couldn't get out of them uh, 
and I got lucky, a really bad one I was in when I was uh, really young, um, when I was in high school, uh, they got bored and went and got a new supply and let me go. And that's the only reason I got out of it. Um, because I didn't know how back then. Uh, and so it was like friendships, romances, and even like work and professional relationships where bosses would coerce and manipulate me. Um, because I was really vulnerable to that because I didn't know how to read the signals and because of the behaviorism that was used on me when I was really young, you know, I didn't know how to speak up for my needs and I felt like my needs were less important than the needs of other people and so that I needed to like put my needs aside to make other people more comfortable and like I didn't know, I knew how to ignore that feeling like I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this and I knew how to ignore that and just do it anyway because I thought that's just what I had to do all the time because I learned to like just fawn and just be compliant because I was groomed to think my needs don't matter my entire life. Um, and the last eight years has been me working that back because I burnt myself out and got to a point where I was ready to be not alive anymore before I was diagnosed autistic and finding out I was autistic really did save my life. And I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't found out I was autistic. So, um, you know, when I say behaviorism can be, I'll say can be, really dangerous uh, when it is applied to you without your consent. Uh, I am speaking from my personal experience and you know, if your experience is different, that's great for you. Um, but I am still eight years later becoming aware of this problem, living with the fallout and trying to like walk back and undo these trauma responses that I have developed because of this and trying to like reshape my behavior to where I really, I'm trying to make myself believe my needs and feelings matter right now. Like what? Like, no, normal people don't have to convince themselves that their needs and feelings matter? Apparently I do. So yeah, just my experience that it really fucked me up. I think an F-bomb was appropriate there. Uh, I wanted to be a cat too, TJ says. Anyone else wanted to be a cat or an animal growing up? I also thought I was a vampire for a while. Sensory issues and things, you know. <laughs> uh, they go hand in hand too. This is one of the reasons it's hard to diagnose too. Uh, I don't know what the context on that was, TJ, anymore. It's been six minutes. Uh, I get into a bad marriage for that reason. Same with friends. Well, not really friends. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I thought they were my friends. I like, And when I was younger, it didn't occur to me that like... And on, Oh, I wasn't even that young. I was like 18 or 19, maybe even 20. And I was so naive that I thought, like, if someone told me that they were going to keep my secret, they would keep secret because they said they would do it and you would do what you said you do. So, you know, you know, if you say you'll do something, you'll do it. And so I would tell people, like, things that really vulnerable things about myself and then they would go, like, tell everybody they could about it, like, to use it as, like, a weapon against me, like, you know, like, personal things. And it never even occurred to me that I was putting myself in danger by, like, giving out this information because, like, oh, they said they wouldn't tell anybody, like, you know? I mean, it just didn't occur to me, like, oh, people lie. And I'm, like, 19, 20 years old. I got so jacked around so many times, just jerked around by people. Made me really guarded. Like, I'm very guarded and very afraid to, like, let new people in now because I'm scared I'm going to get manipulated and coerced and end up in another bad relationship and I'm like I want to get back out and start dating <laughs> but I'm scared of people and that makes it really hard to date like when you're scared of people or like someone was hitting on me the other day and I was feeling it I was vibing they were attractive they were cute like I was into it and it just like didn't occur to me and then I was like 20 minutes later I was like they were hitting on me weren't they and he was like yeah totally <laughs> like but I, I even if I would have realized it, I would still been too scared to say anything because I'm a freaking coward Oh, by the way, in case you knew, Dave and I are polyamorous, so David's still in the picture. Uh, we just have never had a close relationship. I just have not always dated because I'm 
socially anxious and a mess and was burnt out and really not okay for the last first six years of this vlog especially uh it can be referred to as pro i can't propagnosia is the one i know i don't know the other one they go hand in hand too this is one of the reasons it's hard to be diagnosed too yeah okay hang on i scrolled too far up uh okay same here it was a long way to learn uh i had to be in the d deepest darkness to start taking care of myself took me more than 30 years yeah and that's the thing is like when i found out i was autistic i like other than like the blog which was like me processing and getting things out because i process a lot of things like externally um it was it was um oh my god why did my brain just glitch what are we doing the vlog uh hang on where's my comments find a cue let's figure out what we're uh, doing oh okay yeah I, um and so when i found out i was autistic i had to like re-come to terms with my identity because who i was was not really a version of myself i wanted to be it was like a version of myself that was like just mostly like this socially constructed thing and i didn't really know who i was anymore and so i had to really go take a lot of time mostly away from people and isolate and just be on my own to like get to know myself all over again outside of the influence of other people um because other people were just i was you know because of my experience with other people telling me who i was and being wrong and so being gaslit about my own needs my entire life i just needed to get away from like my bad relationship with society for a while to heal um <clears throat> you need to eat bobby you're taking care of me you need food i'm gonna go eat i promise am i getting shaky my voice is getting scratchy i don't know what's up with that um actually i might know what's up with that um actually i have an idea about that okay uh i am gonna go eat i promise um what was i saying that's probably why I need to eat. It's my brain's like glitchy. Food! Everyone's gonna keep saying food. Yeah, yeah, I'm polyamorous too. Okay, you're right. I do need to eat. It's been a long, it's been a long, it's been a long day without you, my friend. I see you all about it. Okay, I'm gonna go eat. I love you guys. This was really great. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, be on the lookout. I don't know if there's something you can do on Facebook that's like YouTube that like turns on notifications like you add me to your favorites or something so I can be your fave. Uh, you'll get hopefully to get the notifications when I do these lives again because I am planning to do another one next week. And like I said, um, I'm not going to schedule them because executive functioning and just the whole idea of that is an obstacle for me right now. But when I find myself a free time, any day I get done with my work early and things don't take longer than I think it will, um, probably no more than once a week, not every day, uh, but like a couple times a month, maybe every other week, every week. I don't know when I have free time and I feel like there's some room I'm going to do a live. Uh, and now I'm going to go eat. You're definitely one of my faves. Oh, Bobby, you're so sweet. Oh, uh, I, 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 I missed you all. <laughs> I really did. I miss, I miss doing these lives. I just like really, I needed to take a break and some space from a lot of things. I needed to think a lot about the direction I want this blog to go in. I've got a lot of ideas and things I haven't really even announced yet. Um, coming in the new year for 2025 now that I think I'm stable, you know, like that's the thing, like you gotta have that stability. Um, and so now I've got some stability and I've had some time to reflect on things I did in the past, things I don't want to do in the future, and things I'd like to do in the future. Um, I'm back. I'm back. Na 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 na. Anyway. Alright, I'm going to go do the food and I will hopefully see you guys next week. <clears throat> I need to go get me a hydration beverage other than coffee. I'm getting this smoky, sultry voice. It sounds like a... Yeah, I don't know what it sounds like phone s operator <laughs> it's not what i'm going for <clears throat> i can't fix it i can't change it back all right i'll see you next time bye lovies nbc <laughs> bye